Ladies and gentlemen, welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of the largest and oldest wrestling family on the planet. Listen to what I'm saying. That's right. Bring that camera in here a little bit closer. Through 93 years and four Four generations. The stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name, you will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Hey everybody, welcome in once again. Let's do it. It's another stud cast with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. I'm David Summers, and now it's the story of wrestling in America as told by the stud, whose family started the profession 100 years ago. Now we step back into the ring and back into time, and there ain't no hoss like the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. Hey, Ron, how's it going, man? It's good. It's good, man. A little different uh, scenario this week. Uh, down in Tampa, visiting my brother and uh, and my mom had a little accident. So uh, down here spending a couple of days. So we're uh, in a little different location. But, man, we're going to be talking about the same good stuff. And, uh, well, we got a really loaded one for everybody today, Dave. Jeez. Hey. We're going to talk about all kinds of different <laughs> I could tell. I was kind of glancing at your notes earlier, and I thought, holy cow, are we going to get all of this into the show? So is it good to be back in Central Florida for a few, for a few minutes at least? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's nice, but it's warm. It's already yeah. 90 degrees. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's up there in temperature, and uh, it's, uh, it's a big difference in being in Tennessee, man, with that uh, 70s and stuff like that instead of the 90s. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's always nice to be back, uh, spent a lot of years in this, in, in this state. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. Hey, listen, so we, we, we're really thinking about your mom and our thoughts and prayers are certainly with her and we know she'll have a speedy recovery. And then as, as you begin to head back to Tennessee, we'll hope for safe travels there as well. All right. So the first part of this week's stud cast title, Garvin versus Malenko in Tennessee Let's me know that Malenko's first appearance ever in southeastern Knoxville last week seems like it got Don Curtis's and Ronnie Garvin's attention, even though there was about to be a major confrontation between those two in Tennessee. But the thing I don't understand, I'm not getting yet, is the second part of the title, Gulf Coast Tag Belts. So fill us in on that, Stud. Well, you know, we got so much going on in Knoxville. There's a lot going on down south in southeastern Gulf Coast. And we had ordered tag belts uh, when we opened the company, actually prior to opening the company, to start with new belts. And those belts were about a late, uh, they were late by a month coming in. So uh, so I had hoped to have the assassins uh, uh, on them by now. The assassins that would have won a whole lot of matches. In fact, they'd won all their matches, basically. Uh, but getting the belts uh, made in those days, it's not as easy as today, Dave. Everybody's making wrestling belts today. <laughs> you know, it's the biggest biggest part of the industry. Yeah. And uh, back in the day, you had to find the right guy to make your belts for you. And uh, and they were usually always late. And that's what happened in this case. Uh, they were about uh, a month late getting there. So we're going to be down south in this episode uh, having a uh, a tournament. For those belts, the tag team tournament for the belts. So, uh, and, uh, you know, Dothan was off to a great start uh, compared, obviously, to the other markets that we've opened there so far. Uh, the wrestling tournaments uh, with the winners getting presented the belts, uh, that's always a great card. I mean, wow, you, you have a tournament, fans love it, they get to see a lot of matches, <laughs> uh, a lot of different people. Yep. Uh, so, it's a, it's a good card no matter when you have one of these. And we had this good momentum going Dothan at this point. The crowds were growing each week. And I felt like, man, we got the belts here, and let's just throw them this tournament and uh, see if we can't maybe jump the house a little bit, uh, certainly keep it improving. So the tournament in Dothan had eight teams in it, and that number of teams uh, 
We turn up, uh, turn out that's going to make seven matches in all for fans. That's about two more matches. We talked last week about having five matches on the card there. They're going to get an extra couple of matches because it's a tournament. And it appeared to be uh, and truly was a larger event than a regular card. No doubt about that. And, uh, and that fact usually drew a bigger crowd than normal. Mm -hmm. So the key here, man, Davis, was keeping the success and the momentum going down there. Yeah, because once you get it started, if you lose it, then it's so difficult to get it back. Speaking of momentum, moving forward, this is exactly what is happening with your ClassicContinentalWrestling.com streaming channel. You told me a couple of days ago about how pleased you were with the response from fans as they've subscribed to what I think is going to be the best old school wrestling streaming channel anywhere, stud. Well, I appreciate that, man. Uh, and, it, and it really is beginning to take off time. You know, and uh, something new uh, is on there just about every day. And in fact, already this week, uh, just uh, day, uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, on Tuesday, April 26th, we put another great documentary up on there. And this one is uh, one that's very professionally done. It comes from one of the great Southern talents. It's all about uh, Tony Anthony, the dirty white boy, and his, and his lady called the dirty white girl. And I won't go there. You know, I'm not so sure what all that was about, but there was a pretty different name for any wrestler back in those days. And this this one has everything, man. It's got the matches and the interviews from other wrestlers. And, and it's got one of the best angles ever done in continental wrestling. Uh, and it was after I had sold the company between a Dirty White Boy and Dr. Tom Pritchard. And then it involved the Dirty White Girl. And she kind of set up Tom Pritchard <laughs> at the set. And then... Uh, White boy attacked him, and then white boy actually put a noose around his neck, drug him from the set out to the ring, and hung him. Man. Wow. And, uh, uh -huh. and it actually, uh, when Tom tells the story, he, he was about to die. He, he was literally being hung, and uh, <laughs> his hands tied behind his back. With uh, He actually handcuffed his hands behind his back and hung him. Wow. So, uh, so uh, this documentary is, is going to be uh, – only going to be on there for 30 days, man. And, uh, and then it's going to go from from the uh, from the streaming site to Amazon. <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, and then the regular public will be able to buy it there. So uh, I'm really thankful to Tony Anthony for allowing me to debut this great piece uh, on my streaming channel, man. Hey, that's a big deal. And for those who have seen this extremely dangerous hanging of Dr. Tom Pritchard, that's exactly what it is. They'll probably want to see it again. It's one of the most chilling things I think I've ever seen in professional wrestling. So what what else is new, Stud? Well, legendary Ron Wright, man, has got his three-hour Stars of the Sports show is up now uh, on the site as well. And, and, and instead of it just being all audio, it's filled now with photos, man, from beginning to end. And it's going to make these Stars of the Sports uh, much more uh, – uh, great product, man. They'll be tremendous with these uh, great uh, photos. That uh, And I got a, co a company out in, up north that's been putting the photos into these for me, and I'm very, very happy with the job they've done for me. So very soon, the second Superstars of the Past is coming, and that's going to be about um, Martin Farmer Burns, man, uh, who he's going to follow Abraham Lincoln, uh, <laughs> who was the first Superstars of the Past. That first person, yeah. Yeah, you know, oddly enough, Abraham Lincoln was a heck of a wrestler, you know, and I don't think people much know that. But uh, I think these superstars of the past are going to be great for people that uh, that uh, enjoy hearing about uh, just that, the superstars of the past. And uh, I don't think anybody expected Abraham Lincoln to be in there. <laughs> Does it ever get old if I ask you, did you ever see him wrestle? <laughs> okay. I couldn't. No, not in person. I couldn't. Okay. I couldn't resist. No, no. I, and I never saw any videos either. I don't think they were shooting stuff. Back yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't think so. All right, I, if I remember correctly, you're going to be re this is cool. this is crazy. This is cool. You're going to be reading the book on the streaming channel, chapter by chapter, as it's being written. So I, I don't think that's ever been done before. Yeah. To my knowledge, it hasn't been done. And the name of the book is A Real History of American Professional Wrestling. And it's going to have these these superstars of the past are going to be included in these in the book for sure. And it begins in the 1800s with Abraham Lincoln and is followed up by Farmer Burns, who was a tremendous shooter. And, uh, 
and they're one of the most famous wrestlers in the book. And, uh, and they're going to be well known. It's just filled with well known facts about professional wrestling and how it became such a popular sport. Well, I don't, I don't know of another streaming channel in the entire world where you can get anywhere near as much content of all different kinds as your classic continental wrestling.com streaming channel. Let me say it again. Classic continental wrestling.com. The streaming channel. You can subscribe now. It's only four ninety nine monthly, thirty nine ninety nine annually. That annual fee is just over three dollars per month. That's it. Don't forget, you can subscribe now. Get one week free trial on the site to see if you like it. That is part. That, that that's just unbelievable to me. So you should cash in now. A free one week trial. So where do we ride today, Stud? How do you start this Stud Cast today? Well, man, it's going to be loaded, like I said, and uh, we're going to be in both territories again. Uh, we're going to focus this time on the week of Sunday, starting Sunday, April 16th, and we're going to go through the following Saturday, April 22nd and 17th. We'll start out in Southeastern Wrestling uh, with the great card of April 16th, Sunday afternoon, 1978. Uh, we'll be in the Coliseum again. And our gorgeous George Jr.'s hair is going to be put up against the Tennessee Studs mats. In the main event, uh, and that's uh, obviously between the Stomper and the Stud, and uh, plus Ronnie Garvin uh, versus Malenko, uh, which, you know, we've kind of set that up for a couple of weeks here. Uh, and four of the matches on that big card, and then we'll go ahead and discuss the TV. We'll talk about the results of the card in the Coliseum, and then we'll give them the attendance. And then we'll be headed south, man, to the Gulf Coast Territory for the Gulf Coast Tag Team Tournament Championship in Dothan, Alabama, about six weeks into having shows uh, down there. And the winners of the tournament are going to be crowned in this show and to become the first ever Southeastern Gulf Coast Tag Champions. Plus, we're going to cover the second running of New Brockton, a little town pretty close to Dothan, uh, so that fans get the idea of uh, what was going on and uh, were we having more success. And then on this one, We'll talk about their TV down there in Dothan and then in the Gulf Coast Territory. And we'll talk about some of the other cities that's going to be opening in the territory soon. We'll give them the results of the tournament and uh, the attendance. So given enough time, Dave, uh, we're going to answer another learning tree <laughs> question, too, about recent Continental TV shows on Southeastern Rewind and the cl classic ContinentalWrestling.com streaming channel. Yeah. And, uh, and I think uh, in this question, somebody asked, uh, why did it take so long to bring Lady Maxine uh, in to be the valet of Norvell Austin on mm -hmm. the last couple of Continental TV shows from mm -hmm. December 1985 and January of 86? So obviously that's from somebody that's watching, watching the uh, streaming channel and also mm -hmm. the YouTube channel. All right. So it sounds like I'm going to get a couple of my questions answered in this one as well uh, as finding out more about where we're going to be headed in the future. So what was the card? Southeastern Knoxville, Sunday, April 16th of 78. This was going to be a big one. Well, Rip Smith's going to open it up and against the old legendary Ron Wright, man. So uh, Ron Wright's going to do double duty. He'll be managing again. Uh, Tony Charles wrestled against Dick Steinborn, which that's got to be a classic. Southeastern Tag Championship match, no disqualification, no time limit. Dennis Condry and Phil Hickerson, who at this point have just won the championship between the last Sunday and this Sunday's card. And they're going to be giving Jimmy Golden and Rick Gibson their rematch for the belts. And in a special challenge match, Ronnie Garvin's going to be facing off against the great Malenko. And Southeastern Heavyweight Championship was on the line. My brother Robert, the champion, facing Don Carson in this one. And then the main event I just mentioned with the hair versus the mask, gorgeous George Jr.'s hair versus the Tennessee Studs mask and the Mongolian Stomper against the stud. Wow. All right. So it's obviously another great card with one of my questions for today already answered. The one from the last stud cast about everything that the great Malenko did to Ronnie Garvin and were they going to wrestle each other in this stud cast? All right, so knowing you, Ron, I bet I'll get a further explana explanation in the TV show of Saturday, April 15th of 78 that was promoting this card. It's got to be where we're going to be riding next. Well, you kind of know the deal now, Dave. Man. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, so, you know, yeah, we're going to go to the TV and, uh, 
and the great Malenko, man, and he, he really created an impression on his first Southeastern TV appearance, as well as the next day before this TV. Uh, so after cutting Garvin on the TV show, he opened up Tony Charles, and uh, Tony Charles has never bled in his history in Southeastern. And uh, Malenko comes in, and, and wow, the uh, just really, really cut him bad. He was he was really pretty bloody in this one, and uh, so uh, then he was. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, right off the bat. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about is the TV, and uh, and in fact, after Les told the fans, let's get right into that TV. After Les told the fans what was going to happen on the TV, Ronnie Garvin ended up we sitting with him at the desk, and when the cameras backed away from the close up. The, Boy, the fans in the studio went crazy. Ronnie Garvin had become a superstar babyface. Fans were really, really into him at this point. And, uh, yeah, and I'm sure you, a lot of them had to watch for home. They were happy to see his face because he was in a loser leave town. The, the Saturday before, that was the card on TV, and they knew what was going to happen. It was going to be him against Joe LaDuke, and there sat Ronnie Garvin. Obviously, he won that match, and I'm sure the fans at home were just as happy as the ones in the studio to see Ronnie Garvin still there. So he and Les, you know, they they hmm. first watched the Garvin what had happened in that last match on the TV show from the week before. And if you remember back on last week, last week's episode, Ronnie got him a win, and when he did, Malenko brought his chain into the ring and kind of jumped him from behind, and then he used his chain to bust Ronnie's. Head open, and uh, so Garvin was uh, on the set at this point. He was still patched up. He still had 12 stitches in his head from mm. the shot from the chain wow. the Saturday before. And uh, and he told us he didn't get it sewn up. And, you know, once what? once uh, he got busted by Malenko <laughs> on the TV, he didn't get his head sewn up that night what? because he knew he had Joe LaDuke in the cage the next day, and it's just going to bust the stitches out of his head. <laughs> Are you so kidding? He just waited. And got not, didn't get him done. Are you kidding, Stud? I mean, you said he did not have his head sewn up for more than twenty four hours after the cut was open. How did he? How did he get, close it in the interim period? And well, I guess he patched it up. But what you did is, uh, wow, it wasn't uncommon. You know, I got to tell you, man, it wasn't uncommon among wrestlers. And if you God. got a bad cut and you were wrestling every night. Uh, and you got it sewn up right away. Yeah. It was pretty likely if you were in a bad match against a tough opponent, you uh, were just going to bust those stitches out and oh, go yeah. back and bust and so put them in again. Yeah. And maybe bust them out the next night and put them in again. Good so, uh, so uh, you know, and I remember times back when I had bad cuts like that that needed to be sewn up. Uh, it would take, they might be sewn up three times before I would get past the stage where they were getting mm -hmm. busted. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and knocked out. So, uh, so I'm kind of glad you asked that question, man. Because uh, <laughs> Garvin definitely had him a tough match in the steel cage the next day with Joe LaDuke. And he's like, "Why in the world would I go and get this sewn up? <laughs> it's not going to last for three minutes in the cage with LaDuke." So this, the Coliseum match is uh, where where they went next. They're watching two videos in this opening, and the second video was from the Sunday afternoon, six days early. And they watched one of the bloodiest matches in Southeastern history, man. Joe LaDuke and Ronnie Garvin in a cage. And, uh, you know, it uh, It just, it, it was just, uh, wow. Those people that went there probably still remember it. And uh, it was pretty, pretty crazy. And so, uh, you know, uh, after Garvin had gotten cut by Malenko, uh, you know, he expected anything to happen. And, man, that's exactly what happened in this cage match. Joe LaDuke went absolutely <laughs> crazy. He took the ring apart. He removed the top rope. He kept going to the turnbuckle. He'd get Ronnie Garvin down. And then he would go and start loosening the turnbuckle on the top rope. And Ronnie would get up. He'd go and knock him back down or they would fight. And then he would, when he got him down, he would go to, to loosen the turnbuckle. And finally, he was able to unattach the top rope wow. from the ring. And then he started to use the turnbuckle, the steel turnbuckle, which were about 16 inches long. They probably weighed about five pounds. Yeah. They were made of solid steel. And he was going to hit Ronnie Garvin in the head with it. And Garvin managed to take it away from him. And, uh, and uh, he hit Joe with it. 
And, uh, wow. So that's why I'm saying it was really, really a nasty, bloody match. And, uh, so uh, in the end of this, uh, Joe LaDuke uh, got beat, and that ended his southeastern run. And, uh, you know, and he, he basically got pulverized with that turnbuckle, man. Wow. Uh, it was uh, a lot of fans I see uh, nowadays uh, that uh, remember the old days. They, some, some people remember that match. So Ronnie asked Les, uh, you know, why he was booked to wrestle Malenko the next day, but why wasn't it a Russian chain match? Because that's what Malenko had said the week before. I came here to get Ronnie Garfin in a chain match. Mm-hmm. So Les told him, he said, you know, what you need to do is watch the personality profile later in the show, Ronnie, because there you're going to find out. So Dennis Condry and Phil Hickerson, uh, presented by Ron Wright, who he was so proud of. They were the first match on that TV, and they came to the ring wearing the Southeastern Championship tag belts. They had just won them in Johnson City four days before the TV, and they had worked hard, man, to win those belts, and they got another great win on TV, and uh, they were basically just a phenomenal team. Those two boys worked together great. And uh, they went to the set with Ron Wright after the first match for the first interview. And uh, Jimmy Golden and Ricky Gibson interviewed from Studio B. That's the guys they had beaten for the belt. And they were giving them a return match on the Sunday afternoon, which you were supposed to do when you when you uh, lost a championship. You were inclined to get the f- right away a return match to see if you could win your belt back. So Don Carson ended up in the second TV match. And he left another guy laying uh, Gave him a little taste of the peanut butter. And uh, and then we, we went to the set with Les. And uh, so uh, Rob Fuller, my brother, Southeastern champion, talked from Studio B about his title offense coming up against Carson, who exactly three months before this match in which they were going to be wrestling, he's the guy that came in and got involved in the hair match between Rob and Ron Wright, which Rob won the match, and, uh, and Carson helped uh, Wright to – cut Rob's hair, even <laughs> after he won the match. Mm-hmm. But Rob is three months' growth of his hair at this point. He's getting a little hair back. Right. They shaved his head. God. So, uh, so Rob uh, hadn't been in the ring with Don Carson by himself in three months. Yeah. So this is his chance to get even with Don Carson, even though the match is for his belt. So personality profile in this show was with the great Malenko again. He was uh, very rare to put the same guy on twice, but that's what's happening in this one. So Les basically could hardly get in a word during this this entire uh, profile. Malenko had a lot to say, man. And he started off again by asking, why couldn't he have a Russian chain match with Ronnie Garvin? He asked why he was scheduled to wrestle Ronnie Garvin, but why would they do that and not make it a Russian chain match? That's what he wanted to know. So Les tried to answer him, but uh, Boris man was on a roll. He just took over again. And he said his Russian chain match was what he was demanding, and his attorneys were still working on it. Last week's profile, he said he had some attorneys. We even had the actual audio last week. I don't know if fans heard it. If you didn't, you might go on and go back and hear what uh, Boris Malenko sounded like. Pretty unusual. You know, and, mm-hmm. and then uh, Malenko said he wasn't interested in any type of just a regular American style match. They had too many rules in it, and uh, especially not now, you know, since he was here and he finally located uh, Ronnie Garvin, called him the infidel, who the guy had <laughs> cursed his life. <laughs> and he yeah. was there for revenge, and, uh, and it was only going to happen with this Russian chain. That's all he wanted. He wanted the Russian chain match. And, uh, and he was as much as he hated him. He he wouldn't leave uh, this this ignorant, horrible part of the country. He said until he was allowed to get his revenge. That's what he came for, and he wasn't going anywhere till he got his Russian chain match. So Les tried to get it under under control a little bit. Uh, as that's like to take control of the show, uh, but Malenko just wouldn't cease in the profile. He asked Les if Don Curtis and the southeastern officials were intentionally protecting Ronnie Ronnie Garvin because of what some some people were saying about his cruelness when he had these Russian chain matches, how cruel they were, and that he only needed that one Russian chain match to get his revenge, and he's going to leave. He's going to be gone. That's all I'm here for, basically. And uh, Les found finally a place to jump in in the profile. He told Malenko he maybe had some answers for him from Don Curtis. 
So Malenko stopped less again, asking if he was aware of the Russian chain matches he had had with Don Curtis. Because when Les mentioned Don Curtis, it just turned Malenko in a different direction. And he asked him, did you know how many times that I tore Don Curtis apart in my Russian chain matches in Florida years ago? Oh. And uh, so, you know, Les said, well, you know, I wasn't really a fair of it. But, uh, you know, it says, uh, it, it, you know, he says, but Malenko said, you know, it makes some sense. Now he's got control here in this company. And uh, he's 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 not going to do anything to benefit me. Why should he? I beat the hell out of him so many times, you know. So <laughs> you know, and he did. Yeah, I guess yeah. I'm pretty sure in those type of matches that was his deal, man. He was really good at it. And so uh, you know, he said, uh, "I can't understand them why they're trying to protect Ronnie Garvin, except for they they want to protect him from the similar beatings that I gave to Don Curtis." So Les finally stopped him long enough, man, to get to introduce a video, right? And it was one that he'd received, we'd received at the, at the television station the day before. And it was sent specifically to Boris Malenko. And so when uh, Les got it stopped and he said, run the video, there was Don Curtis in person. And he opened up with an apology to fans across the Southeast. He apologized for opening the door to let a wrestler that shouldn't even be there into Southeastern. And he says, uh, this guy is one of the most dangerous wrestlers in the world, Boris Malenko. And he's left many of his, my personal friends, he was saying, uh, with lifelong injuries from his, his, his chain matches. You know, and, and he was going to, he said, I, I want to get control of this wrestler uh, before he, does to Southeastern what he's done to so many different territories and other parts of the country and the world. So he changed his direction and, uh, and then he started speaking in the last part of the video directly to Malenko, told him that the, the Russian, uh, he nor the Southeastern officials were ever going to allow the great Malenko to do again what he had done last week on this TV show. Mm. That he was not going to invade the ring when he wanted to, much less do something like he did to Ronnie Garvin last week. So he said Southeastern Wrestling, and he said, we've worked hard here basically to gain some respect among promoters in the NWA, and that we're not going to allow Malenko to do here what he's done in other NWA companies. Mm -hmm. Southeastern was going to continue to control matches and respect what the sport was all about. And he kind of started getting ready to end it up. He said, Malenko's impending lawsuit to get a Russian chain match with Ronnie Garvin was very mate was and he was being honest. He said it was making it difficult to work with him in any way. I mean, you got a wrestler who's working for the company and he's suing you, basically, you know. And then, mm -hmm. then they said Southeastern Wrestling wasn't going to revert back to chain matches, which was kind of the norm before Southeastern came there. Uh -huh. Some of the greatest chain matches probably in history was Ron Wright against uh, uh, Whitey Caldwell. Wow. Ter terrible matches. Wow, it's unreal. You see pictures of them. It's, it's wow, can they do that to each other? So uh, he said, we're not going to allow this uh, one-time match between Malenko and Garvin. Uh, that's the only way we're going to do it. We're going to have a match between them tomorrow in the Coliseum. And, and the chain match, uh, there's never going to be a chain match between these two ever, no matter what Boris Malenko's attorney says. So Malenko had sat there and listened to it. And uh, when it was finished, he had the chain. He had sat down. He had the chain sitting in his lap. He swung that chain around his head, and then he slammed it on the concrete floor in front of him. Les about jumped out of his chair. Or something. <laughs> what are you doing, right? And Malenko started ranting about uh, no one controlling him, about hmm. how Russians were the strongest people on earth. And he said, someday we're going to rule America. You know, uh, it's going to be us that runs this country. And uh, so Les didn't know what to do with this type of profile. He's like, wow, I got to get this over. So he started closing out the profile, and Malenko's just screaming like crazy as he's shutting it down. He's screaming about his attorneys. My still attorneys are still working on the chain match. I'm going to get it with Ronnie Garvin. I'm not leaving till I get it. <laughs> I swear, so, Ron, it seems like a war is starting between Malenko and Don Curtis. So – all right, so who was up next? 
Well, the Mongolian Stomper kept kept the bedlam going, man, with Malenko had already started, and he started off, man, and then he did what he normally did. He just crushed the young opponent uh, and with a big stomp to the face. And uh, and then he and Gorgeous Jr. went to the set with Les for the third interview. He was against the Tennessee stud, and Gigi was putting up his hair. If the stud won, Gigi was going to let him shave his head. And if the stud lost, then he was going to take a mask off. So the stud was in Alabama, and uh, Les played a recorded interview uh, done by the stud uh, two days earlier in Knoxville before he left town. And uh, he's going to be flying out of Dothan on Sunday after wrestling in Dothan on Friday night and New Barkton on Saturday, flying back to Knoxville for a Sunday afternoon match with his mask at stake. So GG guaranteed the stud is going to be unmasked. And, uh, and then he said, uh, you know, uh, Don Curtis is going to have to be a man of his word, and he's going to have to send him out of Southeastern, and that'll be the end of it. And uh, there was no way his stomper would lose, especially because if he lost, it would allow them to cut his beautiful hair, Gigi's beautiful hair. <laughs> and then he said, you know, <laughs> my hair is just as beautiful as my daddy, gorgeous George <laughs> Senior. He goes, and, the, and the, my daddy couldn't imagine anybody sh- cutting his hair. Uh-huh. So uh, <laughs> then Boris Malenko, last match on the TV, had his first Southeastern TV match. And he literally stomped his opponent into the mat, man, in the last TV match. And he put him into his Russian sickle, which was a terribly painful hold. Uh, what he did basically is he got him finally got you down and he got you on your stomach. He was set in the middle of your back. He put both hands underneath your chin and he reared his body back as mm-hmm. far as he could. Oh. It was, it was terrible. I'd been in that hole before yep. and uh, it was absolutely horrible pain. So uh, he got this Russian sickle on this kid. And I guess he wanted to make an example because it was his first TV show. Uh, he, Getting, it got him to uh, to give up, and then he flipped him over on his face, you know, uh, uh, from his face over onto his back, and then uh, and then he he he, uh, he got up off of him, and uh, he started to stomp him, you know, and uh, and uh, you know, ref stopped. Uh, he, once he flipped him on his back, and he he he, he reared back. Wow, and it just you could almost hear you know, Rob said. They told me about the match when I got back. He said, uh, "He said you could hear that kid scream downtown Knoxville, man." He said, "He said he thought he broke his back." So then the ref stopped the match, basically. But Malenko wasn't finished. Like I said, he wanted to make an example of the kid, and he rolled him over on his back and he started stomping him, and uh, and he stomped him first in the face, mm-hmm. and then he started stomp moving down his body about six inches lower. He stomped him again, uh, you know. First he stomped him in the head. Then he stomped him on the shoulder. Then he stomped him on the arm, on the hand, then in the ribs. Stomped him on the hip, down the thigh, on the knee, the shin. He went from head to toe and worked his way up the other side of the body. Wow. And uh, and then when he finished, he mercifully left him laying there. Wow. (laughs) They carried him out. I said they carried about. He said, he said we were already sending people to get him before it was done. <laughs> so I saw what it was going to. He wasn't going to get up. Wow. And also then, uh, him and Garvin finished this TV show with the interviews. And Rob said the interviews, man, between those guys was filled with so much venom. He said it, it, a big old rattlesnake couldn't have had more venom. Than <laughs> Holy cow, that's great TV stud. Malenko is making quite an impression, and he and he just got here. What happened the next day in the Coliseum? It had to be a big one. Well, it was a you know, Rip Smith had this match with Ron Wright, and uh, wow, well, he he actually won. He beat Ron Wright, and uh, you know, uh, Ron Wright's a little got a little age on him at this point, and Rip Smith's an up and coming athlete, man. He's uh, he's really looking good for a young guy. So he got him a win over a major talent. Uh, Tony Charles and Dick Steinborn were in a second match, and they had a fantastic, classic, clean 20-minute all-wrestling match, time limit draw. And, uh, and wow, they got a stand ovation from the crowd. The Knoxville crowd was becoming very, very appreciative of true wrestling. 
And uh, in the next match, the Southeastern Tag Championship match uh, between Jimmy Golden and Ricky Gibson, who had lost the belts to Condrey and Hickerson five days earlier. Uh, Ron Wright, uh, they won. Hickerson and Condrey beat uh, Ricky Gibson right in the middle of the ring. And Ron Wright's victory celebration after his team's win over Gibson, it actually stole the show. Uh, and he made fans even madder than they were about the way they won the match. And uh, Ron Wright uh, entered the ring. He raised both of them's hands. And then he got went over, got the belts, and he strapped the belts around their waist as the crowd just booed them, man. It, uh, you couldn't hear. Rob said they raised the roof on the building, man. So then the next match uh, probably should have been the main event on this card. But Don Curson, I mean Don Curtis, uh, kind of he intentionally placed it two matches down from the top of the card. I think he was just wanting to show Boris Malenko who was in control in Southeastern wrestling, that he was the guy that controlled things. So the match, even though it wasn't a chain match, was just as bloody as if it had been, you know, and it had to be stopped. It had no winner. And uh, there's another situation where Garvin went in. He'd, he'd been cut six days earlier, seven days earlier at this point. And, uh, you know, he got he got busted again, so he ended up getting another set of stitches. But it, it just strengthened, you know, the bloody match. It wasn't even a chain match. It just strengthened Don Curtis's resolve to avoid Russian chain matches as long as possible, man. So he made sure that the two of these guys were going to wrestle themselves uh, again for a long, long time. Wow. That was going to be it for a long time between, yeah. between Garvin and Malenko. Yeah. So my brother won his defense of the Southeastern belt against Carson. And in the main event, gorgeous George Jr.'s hair versus the Tennessee stud mask uh, between the stud and the Mongolian stomper. This one seemed like half the wrestlers in the dressing room ended up in the ring before this one was stopped uh, with a no, no decision, no contest. Uh, and two referees got involved. It was, it was pandemonium. It was crazy. And uh, GG was the first guy to get involved in the match. And when he did, uh, Robert Fuller came down and he got involved. And then they end up in the ring and the referee's already ringing the bell. Uh, he didn't know what to do at this point. Then the great Malenko brought his chain down to the ring and he was getting involved. And the referee called for the bell. The first referee did. And then uh, they just snatched him up and threw him over the top rope out of the ring on the floor. And then the second referee came down and then Garvin came to the ring because Malenko was there. And uh, then finally Don Carson came to the ring. So it looked like a battle roar was going on. Second referee called the, called the match, rang in the bell. They, they just called it a no contest. There was no winner. Wow. So, that, I mean, that, that had to be a really wild one for the fans. I bet the fans were just going crazy. Oh, man, you know, you can imagine it was uh, it was crazy. I've never seen anything like that, that many guys come out of the dressing room at the end. So it, right. it certainly was. And, uh, <laughs> and it was crazy for the wrestlers as well. It, it normally didn't happen like that. So the next Knoxville card was going to be very different for the fans than what they, they were seeing on that day. And uh, maybe different forever in, in another way. And to add to all of that, Harley Race is coming to town to defend the world title in two weeks. Whoa. So everything is going crazy in southeastern Knoxville. What was the attendance that afternoon? Well, we had about 5,400 people. Uh, and uh, it was one of the wildest events in, in, it, in the history, man, of southeastern. Uh, it was a great day and a pretty darn good uh, <laughs> attendance as well. We're still over that 5,000 uh, consistently. And there weren't many cities in America that were doing that kind of business. No city in America the size of Knoxville was doing that kind of business. No, I can, I, I can certainly see that. All right. Hey, I tell you what, this is a good spot for a break. And while we're taking this break, you could, you could spend a little time at classiccontinentalwrestling.com. They're streaming everything that you see on YouTube, Southeastern Rewind and more classiccontinentalwrestling.com. Check it out now. We'll be back when this stud cast continues in a moment. 
Don't miss the new shows on ClassicContinentalWrestling.com this week. The new debut documentary of Tony Anthony, the dirty white boy and girl, with matches, interviews, TV highlights, and much more. It will only be there for 30 days, so subscribe now for only $4.99 per month or $39.99 per year. ClassicContinentalWrestling.com Also, don't miss the fantastic one-hour-plus Mongolian Stomper special, also under the documentary section on the streaming site get on board now to be a part of the best old school streaming site on the planet classic continental wrestling.com hey everybody welcome back once again david summers with the tennessee stud ron fuller it is episode number 247 it's called garvin malenko tennessee gulf coast tag belts so i bet we're about to talk about those gulf coast tag belts wild a really wild first part of this stud cast ron what was happening in southeastern Gulf Coast? I know we're about ready to go there. 500 miles south and five days later after that Knoxville Coliseum event. Well, things are getting crazy in the, in the southeastern uh, Gulf Coast as well. Wow. Uh, so Dothan was about to get a special event of its own uh, on that Friday night following what happened in the Coliseum. The, and that Friday night was April 21st, 1978. And, uh, they were going to get to see a one-night, eight-team Gulf Coast Tag Team Championship Tournament, hmm. seven matches. And uh, they were going to see the brand-new championship belts awarded to the winners at the end of the evening. Wow. Uh, tremendous card for fans there, man. Uh, these tournaments were always great. Hey, I like how you, you got the payoff set, set up for the very ending of the evening. You had great cards in both major cities, both territories in that week. So who were the eight teams wrestling for the new belts and going to become the first ever Southeastern Gulf Coast Tag Champions? Well, this tournament is loaded, Dave. Gosh, man. Uh, uh, as good a tag, tag team tournament as I can remember just about. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, first round pairings, we can just go with it. We'll do it that way. And that way we'll, the people know who was in the first round. Uh, the Assassins, they were managed by Rip Tyler. They were going to be wrestling against Big Bill Dromo and Charlie Cook, same team that they had beaten the week before, but just barely. And uh, then Ricky and Robert Gibson. Uh, Ricky's coming out of southeastern Knoxville, uh, coming home. That part of country is home for him and teaming up with his brother, Robert. And they were going to be wrestling in the first round against David Schultz and Eddie Mansfield. Bob Armstrong and Mike Stallings were going to be wrestling against me, Ron Fuller, and Eddie Sullivan. And in the final first-round match, we had the former Florida Tag Team Champions, Alpha and Sika, with a combined weight of 600 pounds. These boys were massive. They were known as uh, uh, the, uh, the Wild Samoans. Uh -huh. their name. Yeah. And gosh, they were every bit of that <laughs> and more. And uh, they were going to be going up against a very popular Gulf Coast tag team, uh, Old Stars. Uh, the Wrestling Pro and Ricky Fields. Whoa. Now, that's that's a pretty tremendous card right there, and it had to be a great tournament. So what happened? Let's see about the buildup on the TV show for Saturday, April 15th of 78, that was promoting this big tournament. Well, for the first time, the Southeastern Gulf Coast TV show had no video from the week before. That made it a different TV uh, already mm -hmm. because this card was entirely different than the other cards uh, and an entirely different night for the fans. And we did something else that Charlie Platt, uh, who was the TV commentator, said had never been done before. We had four tag team matches on this TV show. First time that had ever happened in, in Gulf Coast area uh, in 20 something years. So it fit the tournament perfectly to have these tag matches. It's a tag team championship tournament. And uh, wow, the beautiful tag belts were sitting on the desk in front of Charlie Platt the entire show. And it was a, uh, it had been a, an experiencing, uh, every, we, the territory down there had been experiencing some weekly growth, especially in Dothan, man. Dothan was doing very well. And on this Saturday, fans, filled the TV studio. It's the first time since we've been there, Dave. I think this is about our sixth TV there that the TV studio was packed. They couldn't put any more people into the studio. And I, I was going to make sure, man, that I didn't let them down that day. I was going to give them a great 
Great, great card and a great experience. So the first tag match was the Star Brother team, Ricky and Robert Gibson. And both of those boys were born and raised right there in the heart of the Gulf Coast Territory in Pensacola in Florida. And uh, Ricky had made the 500-mile trip from southeastern Knoxville. And he was really over in Knoxville at this point. And he's coming down to join his younger brother, Robert, who's going to be a huge star, man, for us all over himself. And, wow, they had a high-flying <laughs> TV match, and they tore the studio up right <laughs> on the beginning of the show. And uh, then they had the first interview, uh, and they were talking about the tournament. And uh, they sat down with Charlie at the set. And their opponents in the first round, David Schultz and Eddie Mansfield, they had made a previously recorded interview that they sit and watch. Ricky and Robert sit and watch the interview, what David Schultz and Eddie Mansfield had to say, mm -hmm. and then they answered them. <laughs> All right, so I don't know if you noticed, Dud, but of these four wrestlers you just spoke of, two of the four went on to become Hall of Famers. I bet you know. David Schultz, <laughs> Robert Gibson. It's truly amazing how many great wrestlers really did get their start right there in Southeastern wrestling. Yeah, man, we did come up with a lot of young talent that went on to become major stars for every wrestling company they ever went to. A lot of them Hall of Famers. That's two of them right there. So before we get into the second match, there was somebody sitting in the studio crowd on this show on the first row. And, uh, you know, Charlie Pat's watching the, and commentating over the first match, and he recognizes it. And uh, this guy's dressed in an all-white suit, and he's smoking a cigar. And Charlie mentions on the fact that there's a guy sitting over there on the first row, and he had Wayne Register, who was the director. He said, can you get a shot of that guy in the white suit? Mm -hmm. He says, I think that's Billy Spears. <laughs> You know, and wow. uh, you'd recognize a name you would recognize. You yeah. know, I've been there for a long time. So, yeah. so in the second match, you know, all they did is they got a shot of it. And then in the second match, uh, this guy, Billy Spears, uh, he becomes more than a spectator. During the second match, uh, the assassins are kicking butt, and uh, they're in, the, in this uh, managed by Rip Tyler. And uh, they've been wreaking havoc, man, on the territory since they came. And they, in fact, they had, are undefeated. Six straight Dothan events, they had not been beaten. And the fans didn't much care for them, obviously. Uh, but for a young team that had not had a whole lot of working time together, they were really, really good. So during this match, Billy Spears, sitting out there on the front row in the studio, he got up at one point and he came up to the ring apron. And the camera caught a shot of him there. And he gave one of the assassins a thumbs up, you know, like, hey, you're looking good, right? And uh, so uh, then Rip Tyler sees it, and, uh, and I don't. Not, I was not in that uh, down there for all those years, but I found out after talking to some people that Rip Tyler and Billy Spears didn't like each other very much, and they'd had a lot of battles in the Gulf Coast long before mm. we came down there and started this company. Mm. And, uh, so uh, Tyler went around the ring and uh, right into the face of uh, Billy Spears, and they're kind of arguing there, and uh, the match is still going on, and uh, Spears is just smiling, and uh, Tyler is really giving him hell, man. And uh, all of a sudden, Tyler's team wins, and he kind of jumps up in the ring, goes and raises his team's hand. And so Charlie wants to find out what's going on, man. So he sent a message to Billy Spears asking if he'd like to come and be on the personality profile in the next segment of the show live. Hmm. So uh, you know, Spears obviously accepted the invitation. And so before that profile, Charlie Charlie Cook had a, a tremendous reception by the studio audience. When him and Bill Dromo, they watched. Uh, we went back to after that match. They were rushing against the assassins. And they watched the pre-recorded comments of Rip Tyler uh, about his assassins. 100% chance of winning the new belts is what he said. There's nobody going to beat my team. Hmm. And, uh, and he said, we're going to make quick work of Charlie Cook and Dromo and move on to the second round and then win that third round and win the belts. And immediately after the interview, the desk in front of Charlie was moved out of the way real quickly. That's what we did, especially if it was a, we normally did these things uh, pre-recorded the profile, but he had invited over Billy Spears so they moved the chairs, the desk out of the side. They brought into two chairs for personality profile. They had a two-minute break and enough time to get them seated. 
and Billy Spears joined Charlie Platt for a very rare live personality profile on the Southeastern Gulf Coast show. So it began with some small talk. Uh, Spears uh, he talked about his experience in Gulf Coast wrestling and the time's gone past. And, uh, and, uh, but it quickly turned to Billy Spears' opinion that the new Southeastern, the new company, basically, and its Gulf Coast wrestling uh, had a lot better talent than the old company. He just came out and said, gosh, man, I've been watching this show for two months. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is the best wrestling I've seen here. You know, these these guys are really, really good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they told Charlie he, he was a little old to be getting in the ring much more himself. But he said, my mother, she's come into a great deal of money, Charlie. And, and, and he said, uh, she offered to spend whatever uh, I wanted to make me happy. Uh. And he, he said, uh, and you know, and uh, I've always been in wrestling and, and that's what I want. That's what I wanted. And so he said, I told her, yeah. I'll take your money, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, he said, he, he, she said, he said, she told me I could have any amount of money I wanted, oh. you know, and uh, so Charlie kind of, Charlie, that, that was pretty cool line for, for a guy, you know, so Charlie, man, he was like a hungry reporter on a trail of a great story. He says, well, what team do you have your eyes on, you know, so <laughs> Spears responded, he goes, the ones that just won up there, the assassin, he goes, that's the guys I want, you know, and, uh, so Charlie asked him, he says, why, why them? Why, why he picked them? And, yeah. uh, so Spears, he couldn't get the words out of his mouth fast enough. He, he said, well, you know, because they're a great team. And he says, uh, I've never seen anybody that's, uh, that's got the potential these guys got. It, and, and, and they're young. You can tell they're young and they've not been together long. And he says, imagine what they could do if they had a real manager instead of being handled by a bumbling, fumbling fool like Rip Tyler. <laughs> now, <laughs> he wasn't too complimentary to Tyler. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, obviously there's monitors in the dressing rooms so that the wrestlers can see the interviews. They can see what's going on in the ring. So, uh, and then <laughs> Billy Spears really makes a horrible remark about Rip Tyler. So the heels dressing room was on the far side of the studio. And all of a sudden, the door in that dressing room flies open, and out comes Rip Tyler, and he's got both the assassins trying to hold him. He's going to come across and, and beat the hell out of, the, out of poor Billy Spears, man, who's an older dude and out of shape. And uh, so Tyler bolted out of the dressing room door and into the studio, and the assassins are trying to stop him and hold him back. And uh, so Tyler couldn't get away from him. And he, he finally started screaming to Spears, who was on the far side of the studio with Liz. And he and he said, uh, he said something like, I don't care how damn much money you and your mama got. He said, this is my team. And they can't be bought. <laughs> <laughs> so Billy Spears gets up from his chair because he's a little concerned that Tyler might get to him, right? So mm -hmm. he kind of started to leave the set and then he was going to go out the back door of the studio in the part of the studio where the baby faces were dressed. And as he was leaving, he, he grabbed Charlie's microphone and he screamed to Tyler and he says, uh, we're going to see about that next Friday night, man, <laughs> whether, wow. whether they can't be bought basically. <laughs> all right. So, all right. I'm very familiar with both of those guys from Gulf coast wrestling in the late 1960s and even early seventies. So what have you got cooking now, Ron? Well, you know, just like Billy Spears said, uh, we, we're going to have to wait to see the next Saturday and the next podcast. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. So, but right now, man, we got the third TV match of this TV show. And, uh, and it had two of the all-time great Polynesian wrestlers, man, known as the Wild Samoans. Mm -hmm. And they made their home in Pensacola, Florida. And their first names was Atha and Sika. Okay, Stud, I think, I think you're talking about the same wrestlers that are being portrayed in the current very popular TV show called Young Rock about Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, that is now the biggest, of course, he's the biggest actor on the planet. Yeah, yeah I guess he is, man. And yeah, yeah, yeah and that's the one, the Athlon Sika. They, they, they happen to be part of his family, you know? So it's a small world, ain't it, Dave? <laughs> For so real. these two small, yeah. small ones, man, a, a phenomenal team, a former tag team champions. Uh, and my brother and I actually had, had got a win over them, won the Florida championship from them in Miami, Florida in 1972, the same two guys. Wow. And in Southeastern in the early 80s, man, 
uh, that relationship is going to go much deeper because uh, once they get involved in this tournament, uh, something's going to happen. They got a son. One of them had a son that's going to join forces within uh, a few years in the, the early 80s. They're going to join forces with Johnny Rich and Scott Armstrong. They're going to become a tremendous tag team in the southeastern Gulf Coast. They're going to be called the Rat Patrol. Oh. And, uh, and uh, the, the, their kid, their son, is called the Tonga Kid. And the Tonga Kid, man, is uh, going to be another one of those Southeastern stars that's going to eventually go to WWF, and he's going to become a Hall of Famer. Are you kidding? So we got three Hall of Famers, basically. Wow. They're, they're on this TV. Oh, no doubt. So this is almost too much to digest in one stud cast. This is a big one. The Rock, biggest star in movies today, his friends and family members – Afa and Sika from Pensacola, Florida, one of their sons got his start with Southeastern, went on to become another Hall of Famer. Your life has really been amazing. And so have these studcast, I got to tell you, in this last episode especially. So what happened when Afa and Sika hit the Southeastern ring on TV Saturday, April 15th of 78? Well, what do you think, Dave? I mean, they just destroyed a mayhem. Of guys, man. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, and they instantly, man, went to the favorites to win the tournament. And most people's eyes, I mean, they watched this. They go, who's going to beat them, man? And uh, they re-recorded their interview uh, about their first round match. is going to be with the local Dothan Stars, basically, Wrestling Pro and Ricky Fields. And uh, Pro and Fields were on there. They were at the TV, and they actually made an interview together that day. They weren't wrestling on TV, but they did the interview. And uh, so the last match of the TV featured the man, Bob Armstrong and uh, Mike Stallings. And they ended the show with the studio on their feet. Uh, Bob put one of, one of his opponent, one of their opponents to sleep. And Mike Stallings once had to get other one give up in an abdominal stretch. So Eddie Sullivan and I were on the pre-recorded comments talking about Armstrong and Stallings uh, moving on in the tournament. And Bob closes out the show with a great interview, man about the huge tournament uh, that the fans in Dothan were going to see, uh, the, you know, the, 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 next, uh, f the next Friday night. And then he, he said something about it being a, a tournament worthy of fans anywhere in the world. And coming up six days later, uh, whoever won the belts were probably going to be two of the best wrestlers ever <laughs> in that part of the country. Wow. So I got to admit, for the first time since Southeastern Gulf Coast started, I think their TV might have just been better than Knoxville. I don't know. What do you think? What happened in the What happened in the Houston County Farm Center six nights later? Well, the Assassins beat Charlie Cook and Bill Drum in the first round. Bob Armstrong, Mike Stallings got a win over Eddie Sullivan. I end up losing along with Sullivan. Uh, Ricky Gibson and Robert Gibson got a win over Eddie Mansfield, uh, and David Schultz didn't make it into the second round. Uh, Athan Sika beat the wrestling pro and Ricky Fields, as gosh, as most people would have thought after seeing those boys on TV. And then in the second round, the Assassins won over Armstrong and Stallings. They moved on in the tournament to the finals. And then Ricky and Robert Gibson beat the two wild Samoans, man. Uh, pretty amazing wow, <laughs> you know, to end up in the tournament finals themselves. Then in the championship match, the Assassins, they pretty much had the match uh, won. The victory was in sight. They, they had Robert Gibson. He was full Nelson by one of the Assassins. And the referee was on the other side of the ring with uh, the other two guys. And uh, Rip Tyler jumped up on the apron. And they had plenty of time. Referees over there. And uh, they came for the Assassin and, uh, and, the, and Ricky apart over there. So Tyler jumps up on the apron, he reaches out and gets something out of his pocket and he puts it on his hand. And about the time he's getting ready to throw the punch, Billy Spears, same guy from the TV show six days earlier, he suddenly comes out of the crowd and he grabs Tyler by his pants leg. And Tyler looks down for a second and then he shook his leg and he kind of shook Spears off of his leg. And then he looked around real quick and he was, and at this point he was in a hurry, to, I gotta get this done. And, uh, and he very hurriedly and clumsily as well, 
He threw a punch at Robert Gibson, and Gibson ducked, and Tyler hit his man, oh. his assassin, Uh-oh. with the same object that ripped. He was going to beat Robert Gibson and win the championship with. And the assassin went down hard, man, and uh, Robert Gibson covered him. And Tyler had tried to get through the ropes to, to, to stop it, and he fell on his face, and the referee got the three count. And, uh, wow, that building exploded. Fans were really getting into this crew by this point, and especially in Tokyo. So uh, Ricky and Robert Gibson, they were awarded the belts right in the middle of the ring. Assassin's still laying there out cold. And they're being presented the belts, and the fans are going crazy. Uh, and they became, obviously, the first Southeastern Gulf Coast Tag Champions. And uh, Billy Spears had walked away from ringside after he got his little uh, moment done. And uh, the assassin uh, that wasn't hit, uh, he couldn't get his partner back <laughs> alive even, uh, if, you know. And then he got mad at Rip Tyler, and he got in his face. And they're having a little argument uh, the Gibsons have left the ring, and the building's still there. They want to see what what's this going to what's going to happen here. Mm-hmm. So the unconscious assassin he had to be carried to the dressing room, and uh, along behind the guys that had him on the stretcher was the the other assassin and Tyler still arguing. And, uh, so the uh, the new wrestling fans, man, they celebrated that night in their tournament. They had a great tournament and a great night. Fans really, really, they got hooked on a lot of new guys. So each week you're you're watching the needle move a little more for southeastern Gulf Coast. So how did you do this night on attendance? Well, I tell you what, Dave, this one was the first crowd ever over 2,000 people Whoa. in southeastern Gulf Coast history. Wow. So, you know, it jumped by, what, uh, at least uh, about 30% yeah, from, it, the, from would- the week before. Wouldn't you say that was propelled, obviously, by the, the tag team tournament? Put, yeah. Put, yeah. I think, yes. Holy I, I knew when I booked the tournament yeah. that this has something, it has the potential of really making a difference here for us. Yeah. We weren't going to go down. I would have really been disappointed at the crowd gone down, yeah. but I was very happy to see us get over that 2000 up. That's a good move. You should look into doing something in wrestling in the future, Ron. Yeah. All right. All right. But listen, Ron, I'm sorry, but we have run out of time for this one and we're not going to be able to get to the learning tree question for today. Hopefully we can do that next week. And listen, folks, this has been a ton of fun on Facebook to become friends with Ron. Please go to the Ron Fuller, the Tennessee stud book page, like him and follow him there. And you automatically become friends with a legend on Twitter. Follow him at Ron Fuller Welch, the website, visit the stud on his tremendous website tnstud.com that's tnstud.com you're going to find great videos a photo gallery every stud cast ever done 43 super stud caster there shop the stud store for all kinds of souvenirs personally autographed photos the classic continental video five pack the tennessee stud mask plenty of those available and the thrilling lion novel called brutus Southeastern Rewind on YouTube is where much of what the stud is famous for is displayed. Continental and USA TV shows, stud stories, Gulf Coast, and Southeastern classic matches, and a whole lot more, including these stud cast. The place you can find everything that Ron has done is his amazing streaming channel, ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. It's all there now and always will be. New superstars of the past series, three-hour stars of the sports series, Wildcat Wendell Cooley documentary, and now already added the world premiere of Tony Anthony's Dirty White Boy documentary with the classic, the original classic Southeastern TV shows coming soon. Subscribe now at ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. Only $4.99 per month or $39.99 per year. It's going to be the best old school streaming site on the planet. Don't miss this special offer right now for a limited time. Get a free one week trial, a free one week trial on ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. All right, this has been a truly remarkable studcast, Ron. So much great content. We can't wait for next week's show. Speaking of that, where are we going to be riding next week, Stud? 
Well, we're going to start out, man, uh, as usual, southeastern Knoxville, and uh, it's on time. It's on fire, man. I mean, that territory was really, really cranked. And, uh, so we're going to be talking about April 23rd, 1978, there in the Coliseum. And this one has a very unusual main event in it. Uh, we'll talk about that next week. But then there's a southeastern title match on this card as well with Robert Fuller, managed by, uh, of all people, Ronnie Garvin. And uh, he's going to be defending against the Mongolian Stomper, who's managed by Gorgeous George Jr. Plus, Tony Charles has a return match with the Great Malenko. And uh, Great Malenko is the only guy that's ever made Charles bleed. And uh, so, Tony, I guess we're going to see if he's going to get uh, – if it, how he's going to deal with Malenko. And then the following week after that, the world champion, Harley Race, is going to be on the card to defend his title. Uh, Southeastern Gulf Coast, uh, we're going to follow its biggest crowd uh, with, uh, with the opening of two more cities in the next one. Uh, Pensacola, Florida, going to have its first matches in the Municipal Auditorium. That was a nice old building, man. It sat down on the edge of Pensacola Bay. And then we're going to, uh, to go the same day to Knoxville. Uh, the, the, you know, it's going to be on a Sunday, actually the same day that the Knoxville event is going to be on. So we're going to have two towns running on a Sunday for the first time ever. And then on Thursday night, April 27th of that week, we're going to have Panama City make its first night and has its first event. Mm -hmm. So Florida gets its first Southeastern Gulf Coast uh, event, uh, Panama City, its first Pensacola show. And uh, four cities are going to run in that same week for the first time. Wow. So we're going to talk about the cards. Next week, we'll talk about the TVs in both those territories, the results of the major cities' cards, those major towns, which will be uh, Dothan. We might talk about Pensacola rather than Dothan for a change. And uh, we'll talk about the attendance in Knoxville, also the southeastern Gulf Coast cities. And uh, plus, uh, we're going to get to that learning tree next week, Dave. Uh, we'll try to uh, hopefully <laughs> be able to get a shot at getting the answer to that question. And I just want to thank everybody out there for listening today. And please tell all your friends about us. Take good care of yourselves and others. And may God bless us all. For Ron Fuller in the Great Smoky Mountains, I'm David Summers saying thank you for listening. Find me at David Summers Productions at gmail.com. This studcast is a David Summers production for Tennessee Stud LLC. Thanks for joining us today for this historic stud cast. The true story continues next week. So full Nelson, your friends, and point them in our direction for another ride with the Tennessee stud. One, two, three. This is David Summers saying so long from the Great Smoky Mountains.